wherever there's mind-twisting mystery, hair-raising adventure, and non-stop action, Panama Joe is sure to be there. And in Montezuma's Revenge, he's got more than what he's bargained for as you help him through 100 danger-filled chambers in the Aztec Emperor's Fortress. The stakes? Priceless treasure. And lots of it. But finding necessary keys, torches, swords, and amulets is no small feat as Panama Joe tries to avoid deadly snakes, menacing spiders, and bouncing skulls. But then, disappearing floors, bridges, and laser walls are no picnic either. It's up to you to lead this undaunted adventurer through the labyrinth of chambers in an attempt to solve the riddle of the fortress and escape with the loot. to the Atari 51 Super Community Show. Today we have Matt, Mighty Matt D. Hey, everyone. We have Michael D'Angelo. How's it going? Almost got his last name. <laughs> My <laughs> brain don't work too good. And of course, we have the awesome RK. How you doing? Oh, yeah. It's been a while since we recorded the 5200 episode. <laughs> yeah, life gets busy. Yes, it does. So tonight we're going to be talking about Montezuma's Revenge. This is a really, really fun and challenging game, at least for me, for the Atari 5200. Of course, I first played the game on my Atari 800 XL, and later on I got it for my Atari 2600 for Parker Brothers. So when was the first time that you remember playing the game, R.K.? Um, someone gave it to me for my birthday for the Commodore 64, Ooh. and I didn't have a Commodore 64. Well, <laughs> it, it, it was about it was about six months before I had a Commodore 64, so I returned it and I got it for the um, ColecoVision. Ooh! All so right. I I used to play it on the ColecoVision, and I have to say, out of all the games based on diarrhea, this was probably my favorite diarrhea game. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know of any other games that were as good as, you know. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I used to play this on uh, on the ColecoVision, and it wasn't until... And when did this come out? 84, I guess. And it wasn't until maybe 20, 25 years later I played it on uh, the 2600... And the 5200. And it's one of the games on the 2600 that, even though I was very used to playing it on the Commodore 64, um, I didn't really see a whole lot of difference on the 2600. They, they, did, a, uh, they did a really great job. Uh, it's one of the better 2600 games. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, how about you, Michael? What was the first time you played Montezuma's Revenge? Uh, it was on my Commodore 64 probably 80, 1984, 85. And, yeah, this is one I played a lot of. Yeah, obviously right, it reminded me a lot yeah. of, I used to play Epix Jumpman. Oh, yeah. And Jumpman Jr. Oh, has yeah. that same feel. It's very frustrating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also had it, I, I still have it for my 5200 that I got a few years later. And I... I didn't realize there was a, a 2600 version until we started talking about doing this episode. Oh, geez, last year. Yeah. <laughs> so I went. I went yeah. back and played it. It's it's really good. Yes, I'm really, it is. I, was, I was really impressed. Yeah, it's very impressive for a 2600 game. So how about you, Mister Matt? When's the first time you played Montezuma's Revenge? Uh, well, I totally missed it when it came out. I guess we had a we had a Radio Shack computer, so and we didn't have an Atari, so uh, I wouldn't have had any way to play it, but. Uh, years later, I got a Sega Master System, Ooh. and there's a version of it for that. Yep. And I I didn't own it, but I rented it. I think I rented every Sega Master System game there was at one point or another because there really weren't a whole lot of them. It wasn't it wasn't tons of them like there were for the Nintendo. But I got it. Uh, I got it. I rented it once or twice, and then it's pretty good on that. I have to say, uh, 
uh, this it, it definitely plays like the the fifty two hundred one, but just the graphics are a little bit more elaborate, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they are. I, I've played on the uh, Master System, and it's not too bad. But yeah. we're talking about the fifty two hundred tonight. So, you know, today when I was uh, actually today this week when I was making notes on this game for the first time, and maybe you guys have heard of it, but I never heard of the term Metroidvania. That They're calling this a Metroidvania-style game. Oh, yeah, I could see that. And it's a cross between um, Metroid and um, um, Castlevania. Castlevania, yeah. And yeah. it's funny, I always used to call it a platform game. It's not really a platform game, because you're, you're going from, you know, screen to screen. I think Spelunker was a lot like this. Um, but uh, I never stopped to think that this was probably the most um, unusual game back in the 80s when I used to play these games all the time, that there really wasn't anything else like this on uh, the consoles. Mm -mm. No, it was a very enjoyable game when it came out. I, I played it a lot on my Atari 100 XL, a lot. And I still can't play it worth a darn. <laughs> So how about a little bit of history behind this, Matt? Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, like I said, this game came out in 84. Um, it was published by Parker Brothers, but it was actually developed by a guy named Robert Yeager. So Robert had learned how to program, taught himself how to program in BASIC on his uh, Valley Astrocade. <gasps> so if you're familiar with that thing, it's, it's, oh, it's yeah. got a... It's got a keyboard right on it, if I recall correctly. It's yeah. got basic built into it. So you, can, you can program some simple games on it. Well, it, it takes a cartridge you know, Astro Basic and regular Basic. I used to program games with them myself. Oh, cool. All right, so you know exactly what that's Oh, I know like. exactly what you're talking about. Okay. So he learned on that, and then later on he got himself an Atari 800, and he taught himself how to program in machine language on that, so he got a little more advanced. And he was in, in, in high school by this point. He started uh, making games that were basically a lot like the arcade games you'd see at the time. And uh, he actually started his own little software, his own little game company, and he ran it out of his, his parents' basement. He called it the Utopia Software. So he'd write games, and he'd, he'd copy the discs on his own, <laughs> own computer, and package them up, and sell, sell them through the mail. Yeah. And uh, he, he did quite a bit of that, and uh, he actually had enough going that he set up a little booth for Utopia Software at the 1983 Winter CES. So for you know, maybe the younger people that are listening, CES is where we used to show off do video games instead of an E3 band at CES, Consumer Electronics Show. And he, uh, he had his little booth there, and he showed off this pretty ambitious game he'd made. He was calling it Montezuma's Revenge. And it had, uh, he'd, he'd had help, some help from a friend sort of developing the theme for it, but uh, it was... Very ambitious by the standards because it had so many different screens. Like most games at the time, only had maybe maybe a few screens, and this had dozens of them, and all these different bad guys to avoid. This, this whole elaborate layout, and it generated a bit of buzz at the show, to the point where some people from Parker Brothers stopped by and took a look at it and expressed some interest in it. And they ended up they ended up buying the rights to the game from him, so he he ended all of his involvement with it. And they, they gave him a pile of money, I assume, and he and they, they took it and just sort of pared it down in size. Like I I think the original version that he wrote is probably still out there online somewhere, but it actually had like uh, some differences in it and uh, it occupied quite a bit more memory. He wanted to pare it down to fit it on a cartridge. So he had his on duct disc, I believe. So they uh, they pared it down a bit to fit it on a cartridge to keep people from pirating the game. They uh they got rid of the last. He had a final boss in there that you could fight. Oh. He didn't have, a, he didn't have any way of, of defeating the boss because he hadn't finished that part. Of the game. <laughs> it's like a so, possible mission. So if, yeah. you do, if you do run across that version, yeah, you can't. You can't the the boss it. is the um, Aztec king. Yes, that's at right. the bottom of the pyramid, and um, isn't that doesn't it appear in the um, the, um, the master system of the, one of the systems? I think it. It appears. Oh, why? I might. I never. I didn't get that far in the master system. Yeah, I would never know. Yeah, yeah, I think if you play in the ma you play in the master system, um, you will come up against it. Oh, that's cool. I found screenshots of it. 
Um, uh, just a couple of things, if you don't mind, that I, just little little things that to kind of flesh it out. Parker Brothers, um, they had to find this guy. You, you know, you're right. He did make a big buzz uh, um, at the show. Um, he wasn't even on the main floor. He was like tucked way in a corner um, off the ma- off the beaten path in the weeds. And yeah, pretty much like behind a coke machine or something. And he was there with his dad. And so um, he and his dad had set up this table, and you know they got a, a table, and they they did this. So the game was so good that it was buzzing around, and then Parker Brothers heard about it, and they went over, and they looked at it, and they were like, "Damn!" And the thing is, is that um, it is one. If you think about it, it's one of the few. I don't think it's the only one, but it's one of the few non-arcade games that Parker Brothers did because they were into doing arcade games. And they thought this game was so good they didn't care. Um, so they, you know, they were the ones that came up with, you know, Panama Joe and uh, gave him a name in the Bible. They just fell in love with this thing. So, I mean, uh, what was he, 16 when he did this? I mean, he, he just... He was young. Uh, yeah, he was just a teenager. Was yeah, it's just one of those one of those things like Beethoven creating, a, uh, you know, writing a symphony at, you know, 14 years old or something. Because this game, uh, it still comes out. I, I mean, there was a, an Android and iOS yeah. version. Yeah, yep, yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, I can't imagine playing this with your fingertips. No, uh, I can't. I don't like no. playing anything on a on a, on a uh, touch screen, like a you know an iPhone. But yeah. anyway, I just wanted to uh, add that to it. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. I didn't know about the uh, the boss being the master system one. That's really cool. Yeah, I like the intro screen on the master system one as well. Y- yes, yeah, that's really right. awesome. But anyway. I did- I did read one review, uh, speaking of the 5200, that of all the versions, next to the Master System, the 5200 is considered the nicest looking one because it's the only one on the consoles that has bright colors, whereas the other versions, the colors are kind of washed out. So next to the Master System, the 5200 one is supposed to be the best looking one. It is a nice looking game. I can't compare it to. I haven't played any uh, any other versions besides the Android Master System ones, but uh, I would say it's a nice looking game. Yeah, it is. So, what kind of enemies do we have in this game, Mr. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a plethora. So, you've okay. got you've got your basic snakes. Those Ugh. just kind of sit there, coiling, coiled snake spitting its tongue at you. Not really a, hu- a huge threat. You can just jump over those guys. Then you got the skulls. you got these rolling... They either roll on the ground back and forth, or sometimes they bounce up and down and come at you. Both can be deadly, so you got to watch out for those guys. And there's also some spiders. And I think, I think these are the worst, because the spiders will crawl along the ground at you. Not only that, but they can also climb the ladders to come get you. Yeah, that makes for some very interesting uh, predicaments. Yeah, so uh, I think those are those can be the worst. And there's just points in the game where it'll put a spider or a skull on a platform that you absolutely need to get to. So you have to deal with them. And there there are a few uh, bonus items that you can get to help you with that. There's um, there's a sword you can get, and if you, as long as you have a sword in your inventory, if you touch a skull or a spider, it'll kill the skull or spider. Now you know, once you do that, the sword will disappear. From so it's a one-time use thing, but that can get you past those little, those little tricky spots where it puts them. And the sword doesn't do you any good against snakes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I found I it think, out. I think it's weird. Yeah, I didn't get that. I thought I thought there was something wrong with the game, but that's apparently how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, what enemy do you find the most challenging to get by, Michael? Oh, definitely the spiders. The spiders are the worst ones for you. Yeah, especially when there's two of them on the on the board. Oh yeah, you'll, you'll yes. have, you're, you're trying to and you're trying to get down that ladder. You know you you have to, you might have to wait it out a while. Or if it's on top of a disappearing platform or something, so you have to negotiate the the platform plus jump over the spider. Yeah, and and there's one board, there's one level. The skulls are annoying too, and there's one level, and it's in the beginning of the game, where if you don't have the sword, you're gonna die. Yep. <laughs> you slide down. You slide down a pole. And there's, a, there's a skull. There's a skull right there. There's, yeah. there's, you have to have that sword. Yeah. Or it's a suicide mission. <laughs> and it's like yep. one of the. I, I. I mean, the way I play, it's probably the fourth 
board, the fourth screen I go to. Yeah, it's pretty early on. Yeah. They throw that at you. How about I mean, luckily they do give you a sword, but every once in a while I lose it because, I mean, I know you say the snakes are easy, but sometimes I time my jumps wrong or, you know, it's something happens. How about you, RK? Which enemy do you think is the most challenging for you? You, you know, I the spiders are, you know, annoying. You've got to time yourself with the skulls. I seem to, like, the disappearing floor oh, shows up at uh, the yeah. worst time. Yes. And, where, and I fall into the fire and turn into a puff of smoke. Yeah. That's um, perfect, though. It is. I have to say that one of the nicest things about this game is that when you do come up against uh, an enemy and it kills you like a spider or a skull or something, um, the game resumes right where you were, but that that enemy is gone. You don't have to, you know, you don't get stuck constantly trying to get past the same enemy over and over and over again. It's gone. And um, that helps. And sometimes I have to sacrifice a life. Like, oh, God, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get this. <laughs> Poof. <laughs> and then, and then, I can, like, and then I can get on with my life, you know, <laughs> or as many as I have left in the game. Um did anybody playing so who played the master system was it uh Matt you and uh and Willie did you play the master system No not very much Mike no. Mike did you did you play No that? no I never played the master system There there are mummies in the master system Oh hmm. on not uh, in tomb number 5 and on the ZX Spectrum I'm I'm talking about the things now we don't have on the 5200 on the hey, consoles keep me depressed. We don't have we don't have bats and we don't have ropes that catch on I don't care for bats time. no bats and no and, and no burning ropes. Oh, burning ropes. Yeah, well, I would like that. <laughs> I'm not sure would all like this game as much if all of this stuff was in. <laughs> it's hard enough. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's hard enough, but it's not. It's not. A, I never found this game frustrating. I mean, I've, I've come up against hard games. I never found this game frustrating. You should have been over my house earlier. Oh, okay. <laughs> it would have been frustrating. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I've been know, frustrated a little bit. Yeah. You know, and I well, haven't... My kids weren't home. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't tried this on the 5200, but on some consoles, on some systems, after you lose your last life, um, if you keep pressing the uh, fire button, um, it restarts right where you are, but with a zero score. Right. That's what it does here. Yeah, it yeah. Uh, yeah. You can do yeah. it once. You can do it once. Only, That's you only do it once. Yep. And I See, I just, I just, I just found out today. <laughs> <laughs> All these years, I just found out today. Well, well, the enemy I have the most difficulty with is the rolling skulls, the fast ones. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you got two of them on the screen. It's like, uh, it's not a good. That's where I lose all my lives. Is trying to get by those crazy things. I hate those little. I can say that <laughs> word. I was almost said it. This is a family friendly show, will you? Keep it clean. You know? <laughs> that and the conveyors where they're stacked up. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I panic jump. Yep. And I'll have it and then I'll I, I jump again and then I'll I'll fall. <laughs> Especially Honestly, if there's a skull or any room where there's a lot of little platforms, like they put the torch in a room where there's like just a bunch of little platforms scattered everywhere, and it's, since you can't fall very far without losing a life, I, I've lost a ton of, of guys in that torch room, just, just right there because you can't you mis, misjudge a jump. That's that's it. Yeah, if you're used to playing a game where you know you can jump and control where you're jumping and how high, if you think of something like Mappy, or yeah. if you think of Mario where you jump and you, this guy. Um, he can't he can't fall past his own height without landing on his head and his feet. You know. <laughs> That'll chill him. And you can't you can't you can't control it. You jump and you you get the jump. That's it. It's just one jump um, height uh, in the game. But um, yeah, you can't you can't like leap. And sometimes you come down like you'll miss one step and you're like really one step and I died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so you know it, it it there was a little I I do remember when I first started playing the game there was a little adjusting because I was used to like you know jumping and leaping and flying or you know all this stuff and you can't do that in this game. No, no. So Michael, what's some of the items that we can collect in this game? Well, other than, you know, that you have, obviously have your weapons, you have your sword, your amulet, amulet. Yeah. and 
which gives you invincibility for, I guess, a couple seconds. Yeah. Uh, your torch, which I have never found one. Neither have I. And oh. <laughs> that's no fun navigating in the dark rooms no. with, <laughs> without a torch. <laughs> um, and also you have three different color keys, uh, a red key, red keys, blue keys, and white keys. And they open doors of the same color. And you can only hold five items at once, which is tricky because once you have five items, you cannot collect any more treasure either. Yep. So you have to – I usually sacrifice my sword or if I can, you know, sacrifice one of the keys, open up a door real quick. Because you can collect as much treasure as you, as you can find, but if you already have five items, that's it, which I thought was odd. Yeah, it is kind of odd. Yeah, I, I would love to see that jewel room at the bottom of the pyramid. Oh, oh it, it was neat. Good <laughs> <laughs> <Get the> times. <laughs> I've never seen the jewel room. I, I've been playing this since 84, 85. Today was the first time I've ever gotten to it. Oh, great. That means I'll never see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You didn't get it past the first uh, no. the first tune? I, even uh, used, I, used, I, I downloaded a map from Digital Press. Hmm? And I still got lost. <laughs> I'm just terrible at this game, but it's it's a lot of fun. The hardest part I have with the game is since he jumps at a certain distance, is knowing where I need to jump from to land on a platform. Because usually I overshoot it. Yeah. And I go fall into a hole or whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> bad about setting that up for you. Where you think, you, well, I'll, I'll just jump and clear this gap, but you'll go just past it okay. into a fire or something. <laughs> And I tried to be a good little willy, and I tried using the actual 5200 controller to play this game. That lasted for like 30 seconds. Yeah, that is an awful experience. Yeah. Well, you know what? Nobody bought a 5200 for the controllers. No. <laughs> but on the other hand, nobody should not buy a 5200 oh, yes, because of the controllers. Because it's some of the best games, graphics, gameplay, just 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 uh, you know switch the uh, control to something better. Oh yeah. Um, but um, anyway, I tried <laughs> I tried using my master play on it, but I was having trouble tuning it in uh, on the master play clone I got. So I ended up using that one controller I got a hold of that's uh, got the three D printed case and stuff. Uh, that works yeah. really good. I I use the Wicco. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I use the Wicco. I used to use the Wicco bat on the ColecoVision years ago, and I used the Wicco 5200 stick on the 5200. It works pretty good. Now, now if I, yeah. now, now if Ed Ladin would get his controller released for the 200, we wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> well, this would be a different episode. We'd be reviewing that, wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's going to get a lot of orders for that thing. Yeah, I believe oh, so. You know, I'm pretty excited about it having the built-in paddle, built-in spinner. Yes, that's you know, awesome. It's gonna be. I mean, I got a spinner on my 5200 trackball to play Tempest, but that's be kind of cool to uh, see what he comes up with. Yeah, I use um, my I use my Master Play clone in my Epix 500 to the XJ. Oh yeah, clickety clickety. Yeah, clickety clickety. <laughs> <laughs> it worked great. I just I had to calibrate it every time I started the game, but. Really? Otherwise, it, it, yeah, it kept running to the left. I had to just tweak it a little bit every time. But well, that's auto run. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work well in this game. No. But uh, yeah, no, I I had one of my best games ever. I I I didn't know what to do when I got to the the jewel room. Collect the jewels. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you don't have the torch, it, you don't you, you you actually just have to blind jump. Oh yeah. Uh, Oh. And then you just keep dropping onto uh hmm. they're not binds, the uh chains. The chains. Yeah. yeah it's I kinda know. weird, like those you can jump onto, you can't jump onto ladders. Yeah. So it's... And you go down it, you keep jumping about five screens down until you get to a pole and then you slide down and then you're in the next uh the next level. And that's one of the things of this game is that you have to do a lot of repeat, you know, keep going back through places you've already been to get to what you want to get to. And it, it's a lot of that. It's not just a straight linear game. You're going back and forth. 
You're going back into rooms that you were in. You're going back up, going back down, um, which I kind of like. There was a game that I absolutely loved on the Commodore 64 called The Castles of Dr. Creep, Ooh. and you, you had to do that. And I, my God, I wasted so much time playing that game <laughs> back in 85. I loved that game. Um, and, and this game, Monty's and Wee's Revenge, is, is, is similar, you know, where you're, you're going back over ground that you've already covered. Uh, to get uh, to get something or get somewhere. Well, that adds to the to the gameplay because you actually have to plan what you can do. What am I yeah. going to pick up in order to get these doors open? You know, yes. where do I need to go to get you know like the one sword to kill the skull when you go down the pole? That kind of thing. It's a it makes you think, a strategy, yes. strategize. And you know you're in for it when you come into a room and there is a, you know a, a gem, you know. An, um, an amulet or a jewel or something that you know you can't get to from the entrance you just made. You know, like, mm-hmm. okay, I know I'm going to be going through some rooms. I know I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff before I get over there. And you kind of have to go down, around, up, back. Um, I, I love this game. Yeah, I particularly like the rooms where it'll have something that you need that's walled off where you got to go around another way to get to it. Right. So the yeah. game teases you. Yep. So, oh, it drives me insane. <laughs> <laughs> See what drives you insane? I actually like. <laughs> yeah. It's always well, fun know. running into. Always fun running into a room where you don't realize there's a laser gate that you're standing right. Over. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot about those. Yeah, that's a that's a major obstacle. But uh, it's a bad one. I know there's one room. that has got like four or five of them all stacked together, and you got like little a little passage where you got to stand in between them. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, that gets me almost every time. I don't get far enough over. It. I get my little butt zapped. And when you don't have a torch and it's in the dark room. Oh, that's even more fun. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of memorization and timing in this game to get through it. Yeah, while well, I was playing the game, I was recording some gameplay to use as a background for the video version of this uh, podcast for people who watch the game being played, along with Matt's, because he gave me some too. And you'll notice if you watch my gameplay, I keep going into dark rooms. I turn right around. I go the other way. <laughs> Screw that. I ain't going in there. <laughs> Try and find that freaking torch. There's well, many, we... I guess there's not many of them. I'm looking at the map that were posted. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the first level, it looks like there's one torch. Uh, I think there's two. Two? I think. I always get the same one. I always get the one that's like in this room with a bunch of little, tiny little platforms in it. Because that's just, I know where that one is, and I'm oh. just happy to look at it. I think there's another one, too. Well, it could have been worse, because this was a 16K cartridge. Parker Brothers had to make a 16K. Um, I think Jagger wanted a 48K. His, oh. his game was 48K. Man. And they had to shoehorn it down a 16K. And in his original version, I just came, I, w- I came across this in my notes. Um, he had a, he had to like delete things that he had in his original version. There was an animated title screen. Oh. There was a character introduction where Panama Joe is introduced as Pedro. Um, that bat, Willie, that you would hate would chase you around if you stayed too long on a screen. And then, of course, what Matt mentioned, the final showdown with King Montezuma himself was, was, that was actually deleted. Uh, which can, they brought back in, in uh, higher end versions of the game, but I, I'm just you know I'm, I, as I'm as we're talking about some of the frustrations of this game, which again I find a lot of fun, huh? and I believe me, some video games just frustrate the crap out of me, and yeah, I just pull that one out. <laughs> yeah, if you want to see but, a real show next time at your house, put this game in the 5200 and watch all the fun. Yeah, with the, with the 5200 <laughs> controller, but I do, I do I do really enjoy this game. But um, it would have been a different game, I think. You know, bat- bats are terrible in video games. They're just annoying. Yeah. That that bat would have driven me crazy. Yeah. Uh, I don't care for that kind of game mechanic. Because you, you do have to stop sometimes and, you know, look at the layout of the screen. You have to, you have to you know, think about. Well, yeah, you do. And the last thing you need is, is a bat to show up and start messing with you. Yep. <laughs> I hated bats ever since the original adventure on the twenty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that I think that, that 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 laid the groundwork for all bats that came yeah. in video games. Yes. You know, I basically like bats in the wild, you know, but 
boy, in video games, they're they're awful. They're the worst. But how cool would it be if if we can get like a 48k version of this game on a 5200 with all the other stuff? Mm. And that would be kind of cool. That would be a great homebrewer project right there. Yeah, I still would be able to play it, but boy, it'd be kind of cool. I would need <laughs> a, I would need Jack- a cheat where I could be invincible so I can see the rest of the screens. <laughs> You know, Robert Jag is around. Why don't we just, like, track him down and say, hey. Say, hey, buddy. <laughs> hey. You make you know me invincible in this game so I can get to the end. You know that that code and that disc that's sitting in the carton in the back of your closet? Can you, uh... <laughs> so what, what are the more challenging aspects to this game, do you think? Oh, my God. More? <laughs> yeah. So, more some some of the most have... challenging aspects, like... Unfortunately, I can't describe a room that I find the most challenging because I don't see that many. I usually die so quick. But for me, the room I remember going into, I remember seeing there were a lot of fire pits and a lot of spiders and a lot of disappearing platforms for me to get across to get over to get one of those, uh, to get the amulet. Not the amulet, a key. I could never get across that screen to get to that key. I'm trying to think which one. You know, and I think that a lot of these things, where they do give you the chance to pick up right where you lost a life, right exactly where you were, you immediately learn what the problem is. And if it's a, if it's an enemy, it's not there. If it's a disappearing platform or something, then you have to start timing. The thing that would always seem to screw me up is I'd be like almost at the top of a, a I guess a it's called a ladder, you know those bars that you cry, and then you're almost at the top, and then they disappear. Oh yeah, those used to follow me up a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at Matt's notes here. Well, you couldn't put a picture showing the jewel room, could you? Uh, I showed right before it. The very last picture uh, shows the end uh, to it. <laughs> Well, that's the I entrance. That's not the jewel room. I didn't want to give away the goods, you know. Matt, Matt he's, giving, he's giving you crap. I want to see the jewel room, man. Gone it. I can't play the game. I want to see the jewel room. So, on the scale of one to ten, guys, how would you rate this game on the fifty-two hundred? I, I would give it. I'd give it like an eight. Yeah, I think that's about fair. I I wouldn't call this like a classic or anything. I think it's I think it's the first example of a kind of game we saw a whole lot more of later on, like in the NES and Sega Master System days. But uh, this is definitely something that paved the way for that, and it's, it is a lot of fun in its own right. Yeah, because you can get to the jewel room. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'd agree with that. I think it's an A, and I, I, it, this is a must-play game. It really is, but you know, if you're really into retro games, this is this is definitely a must-play, and it's it's great on the 5200. It's it's really, I mean, it, it was good on all the co- all the systems I've ever played it on. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I, it, it, they were there. There's never been a bad version of this game. No, no. Uh, how, how do you feel about the sound effects? My favorite sound effect is when he picks up a jewel. Da, 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 da. I yes. love that sound yeah. effect. <laughs> yeah, the cucaracha. Yeah. Especially when you get like, a couple of them really, really close together and yeah. like, kind of rapid fires the sound on you. That's, That's cool, man. Yeah. But other than that, there's not much sound in this game. No, no not at all. No. You do hear a little, you do hear a little boom <laughs> when you turn into a puff of smoke. You hear a little boom <laughs> when you fall in the fire, which is kind of funny. That is a good effect, though. I like that detail. Yeah. Quite a bit. <laughs> So, guys, got anything else you want to talk about on Montezuma's Revenge? Um, it's expensive if you try and find it out there, the cartridge. Oh, I didn't look up prices. Yeah, I mean, I saw like forty-five dollars. It's it's up there. Just for the cartridge? Yeah, cartridge wow. alone. And, and in the was, box, it must be more. So, I was happy to have my Atari Max cartridge on this one. Yeah, yeah, same here. And if and if you want to play it on a ColecoVision or something, I mean, I think they put it on the Coleco Flashback. Uh, no, I have that. Oh, they didn't? They didn't put it on that? Oh, that would have been awesome. Yeah, that would have been a great addition to that. Are you, Matt, are you sure? Why am I... Uh, 
fairly sure. Actually, you know what? I'll switch it on. I'll save it. Okay. <laughs> I'll just switch All on. Right. Meanwhile, we'll discuss some more about Mother's yes. Revenge. Yes. Let's, let's run a cartoon or something. I thought I I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm probably I probably am wrong. I mean, could be. I probably am wrong. So, so Michael, did you get to the jewel room? Yes. Man. Yeah, I got. I ended up. I'm telling you, I just just right before we recorded, it was probably my best game I've ever played. Yeah, you had pretty good. What was your score? Sixty-eight thousand. Sixty-eight thousand. Yeah, I wasn't, but I wasn't going for score. I was trying to see how far I can get. Sixty-six thousand. Oh. Sixty-six thousand. Oh. Okay. All righty. I wouldn't go for a score either. Willie, aren't you going to ask me if I ever got to the jewel room? Did you get the jewel room? Not on the 5200, but back in the 80s on the ColecoVision, I did. Oh. I haven't I played on the ColecoVision. I've got to give it a try on the ColecoVision so far. I yet. haven't played it enough yet on the 5200, but I will. Oh, okay, great. You send me yeah. a picture. Oh, look, i got the jewel room. It's all blacked out. <laughs> yeah, I made it to the first two jewel rooms. So I made it to two. level three, yeah. Holy. And then it, it, it got really tough. And I can't believe there's there's nine nine levels in this game. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah. I, I love when the maps are all printed out and pieced together. They make a pyramid. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yep. Yeah, I love that. And it yeah, still didn't help me. Top. You start at the top and work your way down to the bottom. Yeah, you, <laughs> in true Indiana Jones style, you, you drop in <laughs> on the top. You, you actually fall in to the top of the pyramid. Yeah, the map, the map, I mean, the map's great, but it doesn't help you too much in those dark rooms. No. No. Yeah, it's called playing by Braille. <laughs> so you're right. You're right, RK. It is on the phone. Oh, I stand correct. Oh, dude, I, I, I totally forgot about that. I'm gonna have to bust that out now. Yeah. <laughs> you know these flashbacks are going up in value. Like the the Coleco one is. You, you can't find a cheap one on eBay. Anymore. Yeah, the Coleco oh, oh. flashback. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah I think they didn't make a whole lot of them. I don't remember. Can you can you plug the original? You know, you can't plug the original no. controls. No, 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 you can't. Can. So you have to use their controllers to play all those games. Yeah. Well, there's a Ed Ladin made a like this deluxe Seagull CV thing where you can you can do that with, with it, but it's kind of pricey. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it is. But it's still cool. It, it was a neat little flashback. I like mine. I still got I got one in the box and one that's loose. It's pretty cool. Oh, okay. I need a 5200 flashback. Yeah, I don't know if they'll ever do that. But they probably probably started putting <laughs> they started putting some some fifty two hundred games on their collections, like the the card, you know, the flashback for the Switch and the PS4. I think it's good. I think probably because the controller with the four fire buttons, the keypad, and everything, I think the uh, it would make it would make the unit more, you know more expensive than. Yeah. Of course, you know my favorite flashback of all is going to be probably the uh, the Atari flashback two. Done by yes. Leg- Legacy Engineering, Kurt Vendell. Mm. Yeah, that's the that's the one to get if, you, if you're going to get one of those. Like yep, that. definitely get a flashback too. Unfortunately, we lost Mr. Vendell just recently, which is very yeah. sad. Yeah, it's, he's, he was a a very important person in our community. For sure. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with him out at Classic Gaming Expo 2014. He would come over to the. Uh, the console game room that I was running over there just to hang out with me and talk. We talk about Atari and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty cool. But I don't end the show on a downer, so. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, that's Montezuma's Revenge on the Atari 5200. And my mind just went blank again. You know, I'm getting old. Um, it does a lot. Uh, oh, oh, let's not talk about getting old. So until next time, everyone. Sunny, sunny, sunny. <laughs> Keep on playing at fifty-two hundred. Man, am I glad to get that out of my system.